Hello everybody, how y'all doing today? Um, okay, so today I'm gonna make it the, the case for the Konica Auto Reflex TC as the poor man's OM1. Okay, you ready? So I bought this thing, I don't know when I bought it, but um, a year ago, less than a year ago. But I've put about um, 10 rolls of film through it since purchase and it's really grown on me. Uh, I really enjoy this camera. It's a, it's a nice little compact camera um, and it's, it, it is the most compact SLR that I own and um, I've, I've, I don't know, just, it's just kind of grown on me. I really, really enjoy it. Um, so I want to make the case for the Konica Auto Reflex TC. If you're considering, um, if you want a compact SLR and you like the idea of all mechanical battery independent reliability, then naturally you're going to be drawn to the Olympus OM-1. That's kind of the, the standard bearer for that category. And, um, but they're not cheap. And uh, you know, finding one in really nice condition that's been overhauled or that's, um, um, that's re re functioning reliably nowadays uh, for, a, uh, for a reasonable price is a bit of a challenge. Whereas these things, you can find them, they're, they're, just, they're not popular. Konica is, is a all but forgotten brand. Um, and when you find these TCs on the secondhand market, they are not expensive, and um, you, you can pick them up in really nice condition for um, uh, for a bargain basement price. One of the <laughs> um, it's sort of an advantage of the TC. I mean, for uh, at least for for modern pricing, which is this leatherette covering they put on these things has shrunken over time. So no no matter how well the camera's been cared for or stored, it's going to have a shrunken and peeling leatherette covering. Um, and um, so that that detracts from it cosmetically, and I think that that's one of the factors that drives the prices down. Um, but that's an advantage. I mean, again, if, if you're a shooter collector and you're not going to put it on a shelf and you just want to throw it in your bag and, and have something fun to shoot with, you know, who cares if the, if the leatherette's peeling off? I mean, big deal. Um, all right, so let's uh, do a bit of an overview of the TC. First of all, if you are not uh, familiar with the Konica Auto Reflex family, then uh, I've done a separate video just uh, going over the uh, Konica Auto Reflex line in general, so please see that. Uh, the Auto Reflex TC was, um, uh, I'm guessing the C might stand for compact, I don't know, that, that's just my guess, it's some supposition on my part. Uh, but it was certainly Con Konica's first compact SLR. Prior to that, uh, Konica SLRs had, uh, well, they're big and heavy and, you know, they're this. Here's a T2. And um, uh, it, it, is, it is not a small or light um, camera. It's a, it's a nice, I mean, it, it's a traditional built like a tank um, uh, SLR. And the, um, the TC was Konica's first compact SLR. It was introduced in 1976 with the T3N. Um, if again, the T3 was the last of the heavy metal um, auto reflexes and the N was the, 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 the newer model. Uh, or the, the most recent version of that was introduced in 1976, uh, contemporaneous with the TC. Uh, in fact, the advertising material at the time, if I recall correctly, uh, Konica referred to the TC as the, the son of T3. Uh, so, uh, if I, uh, the features which were deleted from the TC were the depth of field preview, there's no depth of field preview in the TC, and the slow shutter speeds of one, one half, and one quarter. The slowest shutter speed on the TC is, here we can see, one eighth of a second. Right. One eighth of a second is the slowest shutter speed. Uh, personally, I rarely use anything slower than you know thirty, so that's you know, that, that's not a big deal for me. But you know, it, it just depends upon your own personal style of photography whether or not that's a big big deal for you. So the. Um, the TC was somewhat of a budget competitor to the Canon AE-1, which was also introduced in 1976. Um, but the AE-1 was just hugely popular, tremendously successful. Um, it was gee whiz technology of the era because it featured electronic circuitry, electronic um, uh, exposure control, um, electronic shutter, and it was backed up by a massive advertising campaign on Canon's part. Um, I read somewhere that the AE-1 was the first SLR to be advertised on television. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, um, but it, it is no doubt that the Canon AE-1 was just uh, um, was introduced with a, with a great deal of marketing and press activity. A lot of, a lot of, um, um, 
a lot of talk and a lot of chatter around the AE-1 at the time it came out, whereas the TC was largely unnoticed. Um, unless, of course, you were shopping in price comparison. So, for example, uh, the TC became a bit of a budget competitor to, to the AE-1, uh, and I found an old advert from uh, B&H in New York, uh, advertising in Modern Photography Magazine in April of 1979. Uh, they were advertising an AE-1 body for $199.75 uh, and a TC body for $143. So the TC was selling at uh, over 25% discount uh, versus the AE-1. And I have no doubt in my mind that in the late 70s, there were plenty of uh, high school and college graduates who asked for um, you know, an AE-1 for, for their graduation present or for Christmas and uh, opened up the box only to find a TC. <laughs> like, oh man, I got the crappy budget version. Uh, you know, but, uh, but nowadays though, I think the um, uh, we're, we're seeing the revenge of the auto reflex because the, uh, the printed circuits on the AE1s and the A-series in general are starting to fail at an increasing rate. Um, and um, David Hancock has mentioned that in one of his videos and also the, um, the folks at um, uh, the, 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 the camera store in Finland or the camera rescue in Finland um, have mentioned that as well uh, in, in interviews I've seen. So the A-series electronics are starting to fail and now we're, we're seeing the revenge of the TC or, or the revenge of the all-mechanical SLRs. Um, okay, so if we take a look, I want to compare it to the OM-1. That's sort of, that, that was my theme for this video. So let's take a look at the, uh, the specs. TC versus OM-1. The OM-1, if we like, take a look at the dimensions, uh, 136 by 83 by 50 millimeters. And the TC is 136 by 90 by 45 millimeters. So that's, a, that, that's pretty doggone close. And they both come in at a 510 grams. So it seems pretty obvious to me that Konica was basically told their engineers to take the auto reflex and shrink it down to the size of an OM-1. Um, I'm pretty sure that was their mission statement when they, when they developed this camera. But apparently, so I guess the, the OM-1 is What's it, 83 to 9, so seven centimeters higher. So I'm guessing the OM one's a little bit lower, uh, but would also be a little bit thicker. So the OM one would be just a wee bit thicker and a wee bit um, lower. So, but again, the width is the same and um, the weight is the same. So it's, they're, they're most certainly in the same class. Uh, what do they have in common? So the commonalities between the TC and the OM one uh, are all mechanical, no electronics, and a uh, cadmium sulfide photocell powered by a mercury battery. So they are both plagued by mercury battery issues. Uh, neither has the advantage over the other in that department. That's a, that's a big old can of worms. I'm not going to get into it today. Um, all I'll say about that, I, I do not have any experience with the OM-1. I've never owned one. Um, but what I've done with the, the TC, I've, I'm not... Um, I've, I've decided not to invest in having the exposure system overhauled. It's just not worth the money for me. Um, and um, so what I've done is I, I've taken some light readings and discovered that the, uh, at least during daylight, at least in daylight conditions, um, the TC seems to be underexposing by about a stop and a half. So if I compensate on the ASA dial, um, for example, if I'm shooting 400 speed film, I just set it for, um, uh, let's see, it would be what, one, uh, 125? Wait, what did I do the other day? Um, I've got it set for just one click above 25, and I've been shooting 100 speed film in that, so that's probably one and two thirds. So compensate for about one and a half, one and two thirds um, on the ASA dial, um, and you'll get a, a reading which is. You know, it, it's, it works well enough for, um, uh, for just casual daylight shooting if you're going to do anything requiring a, criti require, excuse me, requiring a critical exposure, I would recommend using a handheld light meter or even a free downloadable light meter app for your phone. Um, that'll probably give you a better reading than the, than the old CDS meter in this thing anyway. Um, 
but I, but you, you can sort of fiddle with the ASA setting and get a, you know, a halfway decent result. Although, frankly, for, for mercury battery issues, that is the laziest and least reliable solution. So don't, don't take that to the bank. There are other ways to, to, I mean, the best way to deal with mercury battery issues is to have a tech overhaul the camera and, um, and put in a resistor to, to um, uh, set the voltage or reset the voltage and, um, and do it that way. But um, I've decided not to invest that much in this camera. I may do that eventually with the T2, but probably not with this one. Um, so those are the commonalities. What, what, so what other cameras are in this category? Well, that's the thing. There really aren't any. Um, I mean, if you, it depends on how you define your category, obviously, but my category, for, or at least, is the, the mechanical, it's, it's all mechanical, it has the traditional built-like-a-tank features, but in a compact body. So what, what are the other cameras that do that? And the only, only other ones I could think of would be the Pentax MX and the Nikon FM. But they're not really in the same class because they both have, well, the MX has silicon photodiodes, the FM has gallium photocells, both of which are far superior to cadmium sulfide. Um, and they're both built to run on 1.5 volt batteries. So, you know, the, the light meters in these two are, are far better, far superior than um, the light meters in the, uh, the OM-1 or the TC. So that, in my opinion, that puts them in a separate class. Because th these, these cameras are, I mean, they're worth investing in. Whereas the TC is one that, you know, you, you can buy inexpensively in really nice condition without having to, to, to overhaul it. Um, and that, that's, that's its main advantage right now. Um, so what are the advantages of the OM-1 versus the TC? What are you giving up when you, if you get a TC versus the OM-1? Uh, well, the OM-1 has the full range of shutter speeds and the full range, when I say full range, I mean um, what was acceptable or, or standard uh, in the 1970s for an SLR, for a premium grade SLR would be um, a shutter speed range of one second to one one thousandth of a second plus bulb. Um, and that's what the OM-1 has. The OM-1 also has depth of field preview, uh, which was lacking on the TC. Um, and here's the big one, uh, the compact lenses. So the TC and the OM-1 are roughly uh, comparable in terms of uh, size and dimensions, but the lenses aren't. And the Hexanon lenses tend to be big and bulky. Uh, there were some, there, there, Konica did start downsizing the lenses in the late 70s. And uh, this 40 millimeter f1.8 is perhaps the best example of that, or the highest quality example of that. Um, this particular lens is often referred to in the literature as one of the sharpest lenses ever made by anyone. This lens need need make no uh, need make no apology to anyone for anything. It's just a phenomenal, phenomenal lens. Uh, it's really popular with the mirrorless crowd because of the, the focal length, and it's really fast. Um, and for street photography, you just can't do any better. As a street lens, this thing's fantastic. Um, the disadvantage is, though, that the other downsized um, Hexanon lenses, even the downsized versions were not nearly as compact as the Zuiko lenses for the OM uh, system, um, and they most certainly were not up to the quality. Or I don't know, wouldn't, wouldn't say most certainly. Um, the only other compact lens I've got would be um, um, the 135.35, and it's, you know, it's okay, but it ain't, it's nothing to write home about. Um, it's not, nothing really wrong with it, but um, it doesn't have, it's not particularly sharp wide open. Um, and like, noticeably so. Um, but, you know, um, and uh, there's also a, um, a compact downsized version of the 28mm f3.5, um, although that required uh, eliminating two lens elements. So uh, there's a question in my mind about how much optical quality was sacrificed for the, the downsized conical lenses. Generally speaking, the downsized conical lenses can be, um, you, you can distinguish those in an online ad by the, um, by the lowest um, um, F number, the lowest F stop. So on the, uh, on the, on the downsized versions, the, they close down to F22, whereas on the full size versions such as this 517, uh, which I have here on the on the, the T2, you'll see the the smallest aperture is 16, and um, that generally characterizes uh, hexanon lenses. If the smallest aperture is 16, then it's uh, one of the old well one of the older ones. It's um it's, it's that's that's most of the hexanon lenses. Uh, it's only a, a minority of hexanon lenses which close down to f22, and most of those or many of those are the downsized uh, versions which may involve. 
uh, optical compromises, although not this one. There, there are certainly no optical compromises on the 41.8. And apparently there's a, um, there's a downsized version of the 51.7, which did not make any changes to the optical formula, I believe. I think that's the case, although I'm not certain. Although when I bought my 51.7, I made sure, I made sure to get the, the full size one. Uh, not taking any chances on that. Um, but that is, that's really one of, the, uh, one of the major advantages of the OEM versus um, um, the Konica is the compact lenses. The, 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 the TC simply, other than this one right here, really can't offer uh, compact lenses. Uh, first of all, that are, that are as compact as the Zwicko lenses or that are, uh, that um, um, I believe, I suspect that uh, Konica's compact lenses are, do, not, do not match the Zwicko's in terms of quality. Uh, although the earlier non-compact, the, the full-size big old, old bulky lenses, the Hexanons, yeah, I'd put them up against any, any I'd put them up against the Zwicko's any day of the week. Absolutely. I think the Hexanons could beat the Zwicko's or, you know, I mean, you'd have to take it on a lens by lens basis. But uh, they're certainly in the same class, um, the, the Hexanons and the Zuikos. The exception, I think, or I suspect, may be the downsized, uh, more compact Hexanons, which, uh, which uh, uh, Konica began to introduce in the late 1970s, and which are characterized uh, by, the, by the F22 aperture. Um, okay, so that's really, in my opinion, the number one um, advantage of the, of the OM1 or, or of the OM system is the, the compact lenses. Uh, also, the OM1 is more metal, it has less plastic content. Although, the, I mean, the, the TC has a plastic body, uh, plastic bottom plate, top plate, but there is a metal frame. This, this is not a cheap, flimsy camera, like, um, like say, a, uh, you know, a Vivitar V, was it the 3800 or 2800 in? Um, or, uh, you know, or, or the, the stuff made by Cosina, which was like all plastic, and it felt you know, light and cheap in your hands. Uh, this does not feel cheap. Um, it does not feel, it, it's got a nice sturdy feel, um, and it does in fact have a metal frame um, uh, under, the, uh, under the plastic covering. So it's not, um, uh, I, I don't know if it qualifies as built like a tank, but it's um, built better than, than uh, the vast majority of plastic body SLRs of the period. Um, so what are the advantages of the TC over the uh, OM-1? Well, not too many, but a few significant ones. Number one's price. Um, finding an OM-1s OM are popular cameras and for good reasons. The OM-1 was the only all mechanical camera made for the Olympus OM system. Um, and so people, if you're into Olympus that's, um, and, you want, to, and you, you want mechanical reliability, you've got one option. So uh, OM-1s are sought after, they are excellent cameras, um, and um, if, if put it this way, if I were going to buy into an OM-1 system, I would make sure that I had a tech lined up to overhaul whatever it is that I purchased. I would either buy a, a, an overhauled OM-1 or I would buy a, a, you know, a decent survivor and get it overhauled um, because they're worth investing in. Uh, they're really good cameras and they are worth investing in. Uh, the TC, eh, well, the great thing about it is you can find them in phenomenal condition for, for you know, a fraction of what you'd pay for, for an OM-1. Um, Konica is, a, is virtually a forgotten brand, and um, this is where a little knowledge can save you a lot of money. Um, you, you can pick these things up for next to nothing, and uh, you can find them in really nice condition, and um, um, I, I highly recommend them. They, these are not cheap plastic cameras. These are nice, well-built, compact SLRs. Um, and, um, uh, you know, and the price differential versus um, the, it, its only real competitor, uh, given the definitions I've, I've suggested in this video, is, um, well, speaks for itself. Um, the TC also has a Copal Square shutter. I am a big fan of the Copal Square shutter. Uh, I, it's one of the, I refer to it as one of the greatest photographic inventions of the 20th century, and I believe that to be correct. Um, I, you know, I, I push Copal Square shutter cameras like the Nikromats, the uh, Nikon FM, uh, the Konica Auto Reflexes. I just think the, uh, I think it's um, a wonderful, wonderful um, um, piece of uh, mechanical uh, engineering because they don't, they don't fail. They just don't break. They just don't break at all. They're, they're completely reliable and, and um, you know, nowadays when you're buying a, uh, you know, a 40-year-old SLR, you really have to take into consideration 
um, you know, how reliable is the thing that I'm buying. Uh, cloth shutters, the advantage of the cloth shutter is that it's easier to fix. Uh, anyway, look, I'm not going to get into all this. I did a separate video on metal versus, versus cloth shutters, so if you want to hear me ramble on about that, uh, go check that one out. Um, the other advantage of the TC is automatic exposure, although frankly I'd put a question mark by that because of the mercury battery issue. Um, it's, the automatic exposure is, is directly dependent upon the, the amount of effort you're willing to put in to fix the mercury battery issue. Um, if you get the thing voltage converted, then yeah, sure, you've got, you've got good automatic exposure. Um, uh, if you just want to fiddle with the, um, you know, the ASI di dial, like I suggested, um, well, you know, it's, it's okay for just casual work, you know, just walking around kind of photography, but um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't rely on it for anything critical. Um, whether or not your TC, you, you think the TC is worth investing in for an overhaul or for, to, to change the voltage. I'm not going to, I'm not going to invest in mine that way, but you know, I've got, I have a pretty impressive collection of cameras. So if I, uh, if I need to do a shoot where I, uh, I need a good, reliable light meter, I'm, I'm, I'd, I'd reach for, you know, something else, not a, uh, not one of the auto reflexes. Um, all right. I think that about covers it. So my recommendation. If, uh, if, if street photography is your thing and uh, you're, uh, uh, you're, uh, would like a, uh, something compact but you don't want a rangefinder, you really can't do a whole lot better than this little setup right here. Um, you know, the 40 millimeter focal length, it's a nice fast lens, f1.8, light and compact, um, same, uh, same size and um, uh, uh, weight as the OM-1. It's just... Uh, it offers something that most other SLRs of the period don't, and it, and it offers it at a very, very attractive price, um, because these are just not very popular cameras uh, nowadays, um, and uh, take advantage of it. There, you know, there, I mean, there's reasons for its lack of popularity, but honestly, I think a lot of it is just the fact that Konica is a forgotten brand. Nobody's talking about it. Nobody's buying these things, and um, there's some really nice cameras, and uh, they can be had for uh, for very inexpensively. So that, that's my plug. That's my pitch. Um, okay. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please like and subscribe and check out the links below and I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.